Well, why don't we go ahead, guys, and we'll pray, and then we're going to jump in and finish up our evidence for the Bible, and then we're just going to move right along and uh, see if we can finish in a timely manner and give you guys some good... Um, some good tools at the same time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for Pastor Dan. I thank you for Calvary Chapel Center City. I thank you for this beautiful family, this beautiful work that you've raised up for your kingdom here in Rochester. Lord, I pray you continue to pour out your spirit on each of the persons here today, on Pastor Dan, Lord, on Linda, on all the men and women in leadership, Lord, and Carly and Lawrence and Tony and just everybody here, Lord, Glenn and Johnny and Amy, everybody, Lord, we thank you for their lives. And Lord, we just ask that you'd give us grace now, Lord, as you've nourished us uh, physically. Continue to nourish, Lord, our minds and our spirits. Just give us some good practical tools, Lord, to uh, undergird our own faith to help wipe away any of our own doubts or skepticism, but also to be more effective as we witness to others about you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, guys, so thus far, remember where we've come, we've, we've demonstrated the evidence for God's existence. So we cover the cosmological argument and then the design argument. So at least in that area of science and also in philosophy, God exists powerfully and persuasively, the evidence declares that. Then to answer the question of what kind of God exists, we just made a beeline for the scriptures and we found that historically and humanly, the Old and New Testament is the most reliable book in the ancient world in the history of man. So you have amazingly strong reasons for relying upon your Bible. The manuscript evidence, about 99.5% accurate. And then the archaeological and historical evidence is incredibly strong. But so then the question that really remains to be seen is, is there anything about the Bible that would, would move it beyond the realm or beyond the category of a human book and something that can show us definitively, as the Bible claims, it was written by God, it was inspired of God, or that it might be indeed the word of God as is claimed in the pages of Scripture. So we're going to look now at the Bible's divine signatures. We've proved that humanly speaking, it's a completely trustworthy and reliable book, but now the Bible's divine signatures. And as we've been doing, let's ease our way into this section uh, with another video. Oh, I forgot about that. We don't have the video. Never mind. Okay. So moving right along then. Hey, let me tell you guys some things that we're going to be covering in this session. We're going to look at scriptural foreknowledge scientific foreknowledge, and then we're also going to be looking at structural foreknowledge. So there's a bunch of different ways that the scriptures show us that it really isn't just a product of human invention. So of course, when somebody asks you, did Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, did they write the Bible? Did Isaiah or Jeremiah write the Bible? Did David write 73 of the 150 Psalms? What's your answer going to be? Yes. Of course there's human authorship, absolutely. But what the Bible tells us, and what we're going to seek to demonstrate to you, is that there was human authorship, but there's also divine authorship. So just like many of you right now are using a pen or a pencil to, to write information down, you're really the author. The pen or the pencil is the instrument in your hand but you're really the author of the mind behind it, and so it is with the Bible. So the first area, like I said, that we'll look at is scriptural foreknowledge, otherwise known as prophecy. And many of you, you're familiar with this, but some of you may not be. Let me just give you some general information about prophecy in the Bible in a general sense. And this is one of the reasons why I personally became a Christian. I came to Christ in August of 1998 because of evidence. The Holy Spirit led me to different areas of evidence to remove my intellectual skepticism and make way for faith and then the gospel. And one of the powerful pieces of evidence that really blew my mind because I had never heard of this before was prophecy. I, I had never heard that there was a book on planet Earth that had the ability to predict the future in advance with 100% accuracy. That just baffled my mind. So a couple of facts real quick about this. Over 27% of the Bible is prophecy. There are over 1,800 specific predictions. These focus on over 730 separate matters, and only the Bible itself has legitimate prophecy. 
You need to know that because you're going to hear the Discovery Channel and other people say things like Nostradamus has prophecy. Absolutely not true. If you do any kind of research, um, people have wishful thinking and imagining that Nostradamus has prophecy. The Quran does not contain any prophecy, nor do the Buddhist scriptures or the Vedas or the Upanishads, the Hindu scriptures. And any book that does have prophecy, like the Book of Mormon, it's only because they hijacked it and plagiarized it from the King James Version of the Bible. So only the Bible has legitimate prophecy and only the Old and New Testament, the Scriptures, is 100% accuracy in this area of prophecy. So the Bible stakes its claim to truth on prophecy. Many of you may not know this, but the Lord himself in Isaiah 41, verses 20 through 24, he basically says through the mouth of Isaiah, he says, gather the pagan religions and let's have a religious council. And let's open the books and let's see which of you from times past is able to predict the future and that challenge was never, ever met. So the Lord goes on to say in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, he says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. So the Bible makes this bold claim. The Lord through scripture makes this bold claim that he and he alone knows the end from the beginning and, as I said in Isaiah 41, the Lord himself uses prophecy as his calling card. The Lord says in various places in Scripture that if what he has predicted doesn't come to pass, then you don't need to believe in the Scriptures. So I just want you to understand that prophecy is a powerful, powerful tool for the Christian. And also, remember, you don't have to show people that 100 prophecies have come true or 50 or 20 you know how many you need to really demonstrate to somebody? One. Just one. That's enough. You just need to really show one good, solid example that supernaturally this book, at least in one instance, is inspired of God. Now, you can do more if you wish, but just that alone is enough to show that prophecy is legitimate and in the Bible. So let's, let's kind of just do a, an overview and look at some different sections of prophecy, uh, some different prophets themselves. There's so many places we could look, but let's start off in Daniel. Daniel's one of the most important books. Some people would say the most important book of prophecy in all of the Bible. So just in a general sense, in Daniel chapter two and four, Many of you know this, but Daniel predicted the major empires of world history. He has probably the largest panoramic view of all the prophets, and in, in that book, in chapters two and four, he predicted the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and then the Roman empires that were to come on world history, and did so with, with absolute accuracy. In chapters eight and 11 of Daniel's prophecy, he predicted the rise the rule and the fall of Alexander the Great. Now, I don't know how much you know about Alexander. I think he's a pretty great guy, pretty interesting character. I named my oldest son, David, his middle name is Alexander because I'm so fascinated uh, by this gentleman. He did have some strange things about him, but also some really fascinating aspects. And Daniel chapter eight and Daniel chapter 11, as I said, they predict in a general sense the military career, the rise and the fall and the death, and then even what happened to the Greek empire after Alexander the Great. As a matter of fact, Daniel chapter eight is so specific with Alexander the Great. Listen to this true story. Alexander the Great, during his, his lifetime and his military strategy in about 300 BC, was to go to the different cities and he would, would stand with his army outside the gates. He had no navy, just cavalry and foot soldiers. And they would stand outside the gates of many cities and he would essentially say, open up the gates of your city or face destruction. And as his reputation grew, that's exactly what many people did. They just opened up the gates and they received Alexander as the new world conqueror. But the true story is told that when he came to Jerusalem, the high priest during that year, and I, and I forget his name right now, but the high priest during that year, he knew the scriptures, and so he literally grabbed a scroll of the book of Daniel, walked outside, and that high priest told Alexander that he believed that God was with him, that God was leading him, and that God was establishing him as the new king 
over the world. And he read Alexander the prophecy about the goat with the one horn from Daniel 8, strategically omitting his death, which was pretty wise. And Alexander was so impressed that he ordered about 100 bulls sacrificed to the God of the Hebrews, and he, of course, spared the city of Jerusalem. It's really fascinating. You could do some research on that in your own time. In Daniel chapter 8, essentially, it, it gives this picture of a he-goat. And the prophecy says that this he-goat with one horn would move from the west into the east, literally flying over the ground. Now, that's significant because Alexander the Great, he invented a form of warfare called Blitzkrieg. Adolf Hitler would copy this centuries later in World War II. It's lightning warfare, very, very fast. Because again, he was a cavalry officer and he knew, he knew how to move quickly. So it shows in the prophecy this he-goat flying over the land with a single horn. A horn is symbolic of strength and power. And in the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, the, the, the one-horned goat rams into a ram with two horns and breaks them. Now, in the prophecy, the ram speaks of Medo, Media Persia, because it was a kind of a two pronged empire. And in this prophecy, the he goat throws the ram to the ground, is victorious, but then in the height of its power, the one horn of the goat is broken, and four horns come up in its place. So this is a picture of Alexander the Great who, who went from Europe into the east. He conquered Medo-Persia, threw them to the ground in three primary battles. He rose to the height of his military career. His empire extended all the way into India. He was tutored by Aristotle and was trying to kind of circumnavigate the globe with what he thought he could do there from India. He came back to Babylon with a mysterious either injury or illness at the age of 33. And after about seven days... He mysteriously died, and nobody really knows why as to this day. So this horn of Alexander in its height, it was broken. It died. Now, Alexander didn't foster any offspring, so he had no heir to pass on his empire to. And just like the prophecy said in the book of Daniel, in place of the one horn, four horns came up because Alexander told his four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, Seleucid, and Cassander, he said, I give my kingdom to the strong. And so these four generals, they fought over his empire for the next couple of decades, and that prophecy was incredibly fulfilled in his life. Alexander reigned from 356 to 323 BC. Also in Daniel's prophecy, another kind of a... Um, Scriptural foreknowledge prophecy is in Daniel 9.25. And this is one of the greatest prophecies in all the Bible. This is typically called the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. Now in Daniel 9.25, very simply, Daniel predicted the calendar day that the Messiah would present himself to Israel. I know Christians who have given their lives to Christ just because of this one prophecy. And it's really unique because it's a mathematical calendar prophecy. If you know when this prophecy starts, you can literally st start your stopwatch or mark the calendar, count down the days for Messiah to arrive. So in Daniel 9.25, Daniel was told that the day would come when a command would be issued to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And Daniel was told that from the day that command goes forth until the Messiah comes, would be 173,880 days. And then Messiah would come to Israel. So it's a really fascinating prophecy. All the Jews had to do is pay attention, mark the start of that prophecy, and count down 173,880 days, and the Messiah would be there. So if you read scripture or you look across history, when was the command given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem after it had lain in waste? That was, of course, a future event in the days of Daniel, but that's why this is prophecy. So on March 14th, 445 BC, Artaxerxes Longimanus, he gave the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. It's historically documented. It's also listed in Nehemiah chapter two. And all we have to do is start on March 14th, 445 BC, and count on 173,880 days and take a wild guess what calendar date you come to. April the 6th, 32 AD. And guess who rode into Jerusalem on that day on a donkey? 
Jesus did. That's John chapter 12, the triumphal entry. So there's an amazing scriptural foreknowledge in the book of Daniel, and that's just the highlights. That book is, is absolutely amazing, and you have to ask yourself the question, if the Bible is just a human book, how is it even possible that those things actually unfolded precisely like the Bible said? Well, it's not possible if it's a human book, but just like the scriptures say, it's inspired. Let's move to Ezekiel real quick. In Ezekiel 26, Ezekiel is also a fascinating prophet. And in Ezekiel 26, Ezekiel predicted the destruction of the city of Tyre. Now, I remember Pastor Chuck talking about this prophecy, and this really fascinated my mind ever since I've been a young Christian. And, and read over when you get a chance. If, essentially, what you'll find is this. In Ezekiel 26, the Lord says through Ezekiel that the city of Tyre, for its pride, for its wickedness, will be destroyed. But it's going to be destroyed between two different individuals. One will come and some destruction will happen. But when the second individual comes, he would finish the destruction and listen... The second individual would push down the walls and the timbers of the city and scrape the ground and throw all that material into the sea. It's a really strange prophecy, but as you look at history, it's fascinating how it is unfolded. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he comes against the city of Tyre in the 6th century BC. He attacks it, he breaks through its walls, he does a lot of damage but doesn't finish the conquest. But then about two centuries later, Alexander comes along. And again, he has no navy. Remember, he only has a cavalry, which are horses, and he has foot soldiers. So he breaks through the, the, the walls of the city because they don't want to submit to him as their new world king. And when he breaks through the walls, he realizes that the city of Tyre is empty because it's on the Mediterranean coast. It's mysteriously empty. It's like a ghost town. And so they march all the way through the city only to find that the, the people of Tyre have an island city out in the ocean. And they've withdrawn. Over the weeks that Alexander was at the gates, they withdrew from the city and they had all their people, all their, their equipment stationed now on this island. What's Alexander to do? He has no navy. He's just got a cavalry and foot soldiers. So in fulfillment of a prophecy that was uttered hundreds of years before he was ever alive, Alexander pushes down the timbers, they break down the houses, they literally scrape the ground, they cast it into the sea, and they make a land bridge, a causeway out to the island, they besiege it, and they conquer it. And if you want to check it out today, you can see on Google and other places the land bridge that is still there, the causeway that Alexander made to besiege the city of Tyre. Ezekiel also predicted in chapters 36 and 37, he predicted the rebirth of national Israel. And this is back in the Old Testament. This is when they were still in the city of Babylon. But as you know, this prophecy came true as well. Because after World War II, well, actually what happened in 70 AD, just like Jesus said, in 70 AD, the Jews were dispersed out of their homeland. And for about 2,000 years, until 1948, the Jews were without a homeland. Now, that may not seem special to you, but you have to realize, never before in the history of mankind has a people group survived outside of their country for more than 300 years. Because what eventually happens is wherever that group is scattered, they absorb that different culture, the different customs, they lose their religion, they change their language. Never before in the history of man has a people group been preserved like this. But the Jews were. For almost 2,000 years, you know, they were dispersed. But just like the Bible says, on May 14th of 1948, they were gathered back into their country. This was the only time in world history where there was international sympathy for the Jewish people. Why? Because World War II had just ended. And so Adolf Hitler and his extermination plan for the Third Reich he had killed six million Jews, and even the United Nations felt bad for Israel. This was the only time, and so the United Nations granted Israel the right to establish a sovereign state. And on May 14th, 1948, Israel became a sovereign nation in complete fulfillment of Ezekiel 36 and 37. Absolutely incredible. Let's turn our attention real quick to Isaiah. We also see some scriptural foreknowledge in the book of Isaiah. 
So many prophecies we could look at. Isaiah is fascinating. One of my favorite is here, Isaiah 44 and 45. Remember Cyrus the Great, the man that we talked about earlier? Well, did you know that in the book of Isaiah, Cyrus is mentioned by name about 200 years before he was ever born? Now, Alexander is described, but he's not named. But we know it's Alexander. It's very, very obvious historically. But the difference here with Cyrus in the book of Isaiah is about 180 to 200 years before he even was born out of his mommy's womb, he is named in the scriptures. And the Lord through Isaiah says that though Cyrus does not know me, though he's an unbeliever, I will hold his hands and I will subdue the nations before him. Listen to this. One of the coolest prophecies in Isaiah. And the Lord says to Cyrus, he says, Cyrus, he says, I will go before you and I will dry up the rivers. I will open the metal gates to you and I will give you the secret treasures. Very strange, right? Well, until 539 BC, when in Daniel chapter five, remember that? When they were having that huge festival inside the city of Babylon. The city of Babylon was thought to be impregnable. And so that's when the handwriting on the wall appeared in Daniel chapter five. Well, the, the military conditions at that time is the Persians were outside the gates of Babylon. But this city was impregnable. It had, had walls hundreds of feet high, 250 guard towers, probably 10 years food supply and the river Euphrates ran through it. Nobody had ever conquered Babylon. And so the Babylonians, they thought they were invincible and so they were partying. But just like the Lord had said to Cyrus, he would lead him into victory. Here's what happened. In 539 BC, Cyrus and his generals, about five miles upstream for the Euphrates, they created in the ground a water channel to divert the water flow of the river Euphrates, about five miles upstream. So by the time it got to the city of Babylon, there was still some water there, but just very low, and they could walk through, and they slipped under the wall. Now, the Babylonians were so overconfident, like you'll read in Daniel chapter 5, they weren't even guarding the city. And so Cyrus and his generals, they crept under the wall because they had dried up the river. The gates weren't even guarded, so the metal gates were opened, and they literally took the city of Babylon without much of a fight, and all their secret treasures then belonged to Cyrus. An incredible fulfillment of this prophecy from 700 years before Jesus regarding Cyrus. We also have some interesting prophecies by Jesus. I know that you guys are aware of this. Jesus, of course, is so many things. He is our Lord. He is the King. He is our Savior. But don't forget, Jesus is called in the Bible the Prophet, capital P. And so some of the most interesting prophecies in the New Testament or in the Bible are from him. So in Luke 19, Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. It was about, you know, 32, 33 A.D., and Jesus predicted that one day Jerusalem will be surrounded by her enemies and will be laid bare to the ground. And this happened. In 70 AD, Titus Vespasian, he surrounded the city of Jerusalem with four Roman legions. And if you read the ancient historians, it says that blood ran through the streets like rainwater. It was a horrible massacre. And Jesus' prophecy, about 35 years later, it was historically fulfilled. Jerusalem was sacked and laid waste to the ground. Jesus also predicted the destruction of the Jewish temple. That was in Matthew 24. That's where Jesus said, you see this temple? He says, there will not be one stone left upon another. Remember the stones that we saw that were thrown down? That's archaeological proof of the fulfillment of this prophecy. Here's what happened. When Titus Vespasian surrounded the city and his four Roman legions, the people in the city, as is always the case, they retreat when they're invaded to the strongest, biggest structure. And the biggest, strongest building in Jerusalem at the time was what? Was the temple. So they withdrew into the temple and used it as kind of a fortress. Well, one of the soldiers under Titus was careless, and he launched a flaming arrow into the temple, and apparently the curtains and different elements caught on fire. The heat killed everyone, burned everyone alive, but the golden articles in the temple, the menorah and other things, the gold melted. It seeped down below the cracks of the stone. So take a wild guess what the Roman soldiers did to make sure they got that gold. They didn't leave one stone left upon another. 
And so the prophecy of Jesus from Matthew 24, 35 years earlier, was literally fulfilled in 70 AD as those stones were thrown down. And then, of course, Jesus predicted the dispersion of the Jews and the Jews' eventual control of Jerusalem once again. So the dispersion happened when Titus was there. The Jews were scattered to the wind for almost 2,000 years. But many people don't realize in Luke 21, 24, it says that Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. This is interesting because even when they got their country in May 14th, 1948, they didn't have the city of, of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, it wasn't theirs. They had a country, but that wasn't theirs yet. Not until June 6th, 1967 in the Six-Day War. And what happened was is during that Six-Day War, Israel dropped paratroopers behind enemy lines onto the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and they secured that portion of the city. And some of the paratroopers in the Israeli army, they knew they were fulfilling prophecy. And on that day, that's when, on June 6, 1967, they got back Jewish control over Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, and that prophecy from Luke 21 was literally fulfilled. So that's a lot of stuff in a short amount of time, but as many of you already know, you really need to dig your teeth into prophecy. There are about 1,800 prophecies in the scriptures. It's one of the most obvious and blatant divine signatures on the Bible. There is no way that, that all those thousands of prophecies could come true unless God was guiding the pen of Isaiah and Ezekiel, Daniel, and so forth. But now let's turn our attention to another divine signature, not just scriptural foreknowledge, but something we could call scientific foreknowledge. Now, I know you know about prophecy, but some of you, you may not be aware of this right here. Now, what scientific foreknowledge is, is this. There are certain things that we have discovered about our universe, about nature. Only recently we have discovered these, but guess where they've been hiding all along? They've been announced and declared in the Bible. And this is what we call scientific foreknowledge. You could kind of think of it like a, like a scientific prophecy, perhaps. But God, the creator of the universe, he has announced scientific facts all over the Bible, and we are just now catching up with what God has been saying all along. Let me give you some examples of this. First, in the area of astronomy and cosmology. There's a lot of scientific knowledge in this area. So the Bible tells us in Genesis 1 and in 1 Timothy 1 that the universe had a beginning. Hey, did we already talk about that? Yeah, we did, so don't worry. I'm not gonna go there again. But the Bible, the Bible dared to declare that all time, space, matter, and energy had a definite point of beginning. Now remember, millennia ago, that was a radical claim because nobody believed that. The Hindus and the, the spiritists and the Greek philosophers, all of them believed in an eternal universe but yet the Bible said, nope, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And modern science, of course, has proved that to be true. We talked about that yesterday. The Bible also declared in Isaiah 42 and 44 that the universe is expanding. Did we talk about that? Yes. Anybody remember who discovered that? I'll give you a clue. His first name is Edwin. And something to do with the telescope? Edwin Hubble, Edwin Hubble in 1929, he discovered that the universe was expanding at the Mount Wilson Observatory. But look, the Bible said it, 700 BC. We've just recently in the 20th century discovered that. The Bible also tells us in Isaiah 45 and Psalm 8 that the universe was designed to support human life. If you examine astronomy, the laws of nature like the cosmological constant or the speed of life Earth and the universe itself are designed to be inhabited by complex biological creatures like us, just as the Bible says. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 1 and in Psalm 102 that the universe is running down. We call that the second law of thermodynamics, that the universe is going from a state of high order to disorder. And the, and the, the scriptures have said that about the universe all along. It's called sin. It's the deteriorating effect of sin. The Bible also tells us in Job 38 and in Job 33 that the universe is governed by natural laws. 
The universe is governed by natural laws. That's a great uh, way to prove God's existence. If you can discover any law, a law of logic, a law of math, a law of morality, or a law of nature, where there is a law, there must always be a law giver. And so there's probably 30 to 50 laws of nature, we call these constants, that have to be true for life to be possible. The speed of light, Planck's constant, the cosmological constant, the expansion rate of the universe, all these kinds of things are, are governed by the Lord, and the Bible told us about it all along. The Bible also tells us in Genesis 15 and Jeremiah 33 that the stars are too numerous to be counted. If you don't believe it, try it sometime, okay? On any given night, on a very clear, clear evening, if you have good visibility, you can only see with the human eye 6,000 stars. And so that was the number they used to say. But the Bible, all the way from Genesis, has always told us that the stars in the heavens are innumerable. And indeed, with modern astronomy, we know that that's true. The Bible also tells us that the earth is round, that the earth is spherical. In Isaiah chapter 40, that the earth is round. Now, we didn't really know that in our Western culture until when? 1492, Christopher Columbus, right? But yet the Bible told it to us in Isaiah chapter 40, 700 B.C. The Bible already said that. Pretty amazing. And then Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible because Job lived before Moses. Job 26 tells us the earth is hanging in space and free-floating. Is that true? Well, of course it's true, but yet the Bible declares that. So it's amazing scientific foreknowledge in that area of astronomy and cosmology. Also in zoology and geology. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, all basic forms of animal life began together. That's true. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that life forms remain essentially the same. That is true. A frog cannot become a dog, and a cat cannot become a bird. Contrary to evolution, there's no evidence for that, and the Bible says that's the case. In Genesis chapter 1, it also tells us that all types of life began fully formed, which is true, and then also that, co that dinosaurs coexisted with ancient humans in Job chapter 40. And uh, it's pretty amazing. You know, there's a river in Texas called the Paluxy River, and they have a plaster imprint of a human footprint inside the footprint of a dinosaur. They'll never tell you about that, the Smithsonian, but there's lots of evidence like that. Um, if you just do, if you go to Answers in Genesis and you do some research about dinosaurs or dragons, as they used to call them, there's a lot of great historical evidence for dinosaurs coexisting with humans because that's what the world was like before the flood. Also in the area of hydrology and oceanology, the Bible gives us some scientific foreknowledge. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 1 and Job 36 that water returns to its original source. Is that true? Yeah, that's called the hydrologic cycle, that it rains, trickles into the ground, evaporates, goes up into the sky, and the whole thing happens all over again. But the Bible has always said that. In Psalm 8 and Isaiah 43, the Bible tells us that currents exist in the ocean waters. Interesting story about that. The man who is credited with being the father of oceanography, he was in the Navy, and I, I forget his name, but in the 1800s, he was in the hospital, and he was injured, and so he had his nurse read the Bible to him. And when she was in the book of Psalms, she came to Psalm chapter 8, and she read the verse that said, uh, the water and, and the paths that run through the midst of the sea. And he said, read that again. And she said, the paths that run through the midst of the sea. And this man was so absorbed by this idea, being a, um, a seagoing man himself, when he left the hospital, he did research, and he is the man who discovered ocean currents, and he became the father of oceanography. But the Bible said it all along. And then finally, in Job 38, oldest book of the Bible, it tells us that on the ocean floor, there are mountain ranges, and there are underwater springs. Is that true? And the only reason we know that is because of modern submarines, modern submersibles. But yet the Bible in the oldest book through the Holy Spirit told us that. Last area in biology and microbiology, the Bible even speaks to us about this, Genesis chapter 1, it tells us that life does not come from non-life. Did you know that's a scientific law? It's called the law of biogenesis. Only life 
creates new life. The Bible has said that from the beginning. In Genesis 1 and in Psalm 139, it says that life is designed and incredibly complex. We saw that this morning in the design argument. Leviticus 17 tells us that life is in the human blood supply. If you don't believe it, just try it. No, I'm just joking. Don't do that. So we know that life is in the blood because of oxygenation and other vital things that we need. We know that's true. In Leviticus 12, the Bible tells us that sanitation avoids the spreading of bacteria and disease. Think about that. Thousands of years ago, 3,500 years ago, Leviticus said that. Did they know about bacteria back then? Did they know about germs? No, but the Jews, the, the Israelites, they obeyed the scriptures even though they didn't understand it. That's a good clue for you. If the Lord shows you something, though you don't understand everything, just follow what he shows you. Because they didn't know anything about germs and bacteria. But you know what? This is why in the medieval ages, the black plague did not affect the Jewish people because they stayed away from the rats and the other rodents that carried that mite that caused the black plague. Why? Because they obeyed Leviticus chapter 12. Sanitation avoids the spreading of bacteria and disease. A couple hundred years ago, you know what surgeons used to do? Surgeons used to do surgery on someone, be covered in their blood on their hands, and go right to the next victim and get to work. That was, this was thought to be a badge of honor that you're just a hardworking surgeon kind of rolling up your sleeves and they would go from victim to victim, well, patient to patient to patient. And, and the, the rate of people that died was incredible. But then along comes a Christian scientist named Louis Pasteur. And Louis Pasteur, through his research, he becomes the father of bacteriology and the scriptures guided him, and they've always said this, that the sanitation requirements are very, very important. Pastor Chuck recommended a book on this. It's written by a medical doctor called None of These Diseases. And it talks about how the scriptures speak of sanitation requirements and then medically how that is true. None of these diseases. In Genesis chapter two, it says the human body is composed of earth's basic elements. This is true. The same 18 elements in the ground are in the human body. That's why we feel like dirt bags sometimes. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that matter is constructed of atomic particles that are too small to be seen by the eye. We know that's true. And finally, Proverbs 17 tells us that laughter promotes improved physical health. Is that true? Absolutely. All right. So we've talked about, we're almost done, we've talked about uh, the scriptural foreknowledge, prophecy, scientific foreknowledge, but the last divine signature that can help us understand that the book you hold in your hand is not just a great human book, the best ever written in history of mankind, but it also has a divine signature, not just prophecy and this scientific foreknowledge, but structural foreknowledge. And I think there's probably very few of you that may have heard of this, but this type of stuff right here is very, very impressive. Let me ask you a question. When you try to sign into your Google, your Gmail account, or Twitter, or Facebook, or, or whatever that is, do the companies that provide that service, do they want to authenticate that you are who you say you are? Do they ask you security questions to, to prove your identity? Yeah, you know what we call that? We call that authentication technology. Authentication technology is a billion dollar business because everybody from the NSA to the FBI to Google use it. They want to, to know that you are not somebody else hacking illegally into someone's account. So authentication technology is very, very relevant today. Now, the intelligence agencies use this also. For example, let's say that Isaac is my spy and I'm his control officer. He's inserted deep into Iran to infiltrate their nuclear weapons program. You can tell what kind of books I read. And uh, I'm gonna send a message to Isaac. Now, how, is, how does Isaac know that the message is truly coming from me and not from someone posing to be me feeding him disinformation? This is a real problem for agents in the intelligence agencies today. How do they know? Very easy, there's authentication technology because between me and Isaac, we're gonna work out some kind of a code, some kind of a watermark, some kind of a, an authentication where he knows that I am the one that sent it to him. Did you know that that's what these things are? 
scriptural foreknowledge, prophecy, scientific foreknowledge, and especially this, structural foreknowledge is God's authentication technology to show you and to show all of us who are willing to learn that this book is inspired of God because there is no way these kind of things could be present. So I, I, I love this. Let's, let's go through this quickly. And I'm going to show you structural foreknowledge in three different ways. Names, types, and then the number seven. Okay, first of all, the structure of names. Now, if you're like most people, if you're like most people, when you come to those chapters of the Bible that are genealogies, hey, let's be honest, what do you do? You just skip them. Okay, Lord, forgive these people. They know not what they do. Okay, you're never again going to do that, okay? Because remember what Paul told us in 2 Timothy 3.16? How much scripture is given by the inspiration of God? Most scripture, right? Oh, no, wait, all of it. Yeah, that's right, all of it. Even those chapters, guys, even the lists, even the numbers, even the genealogies. Now, I don't want you to always be looking for hidden meanings. That's unhealthy, and that's, that's not good. The plain meaning is the best meaning, okay? That's the golden rule of Bible interpretation, that the, the obvious sense is the best sense of the word. However, there are places in the Bible where you find amazing stuff. For example, in Genesis chapter five, Adam's genealogy, this is a place where you would usually skip over. It shows us 10 names. Here's the names, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. That's really nourishing, right? That's for your devotional time tomorrow morning. So now, if you take your time, and Chuck Missler did this, I think he's the one that discovered this, if you take the time for those 10 names and you find their Hebrew meaning and you put all the Hebrew meanings of the names together, this is what you would read. Man is appointed to mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest. It's a two-sentence prophecy about the Messiah. You see that? As you look at their individual meaning, you may not make the connection immediately. Adam means man, Seth means appointed, Enosh means mortal. But as you put them together, it's a two-sentence prophecy about Jesus. All the way back in Genesis chapter 5. Man is appointed to mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, that's Jesus, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. So in the structure of names, I encourage you from here on out, wherever you find a name of a city or the name of a person, you really want to do some investigation. Some of the most interesting verses are where people get name changes. Can you think of anybody who had their name changed in the Bible? Saul became Paul. Um, Cephas became Peter. What's the longest name in the Bible? Anybody know? Joseph in Egypt became? Who said that? Who said that? Wow, God bless you. You get a sticker. That's awesome. Longest name in the Bible, Zaphonath Paneah. And so whenever you see that, it's very, very significant because in the Bible, a name signifies character. So there's a structure of names. Good for you to, to research that. Let's go a little deeper, though, the structure of types. The structure of types. Now, a type, this is, you could call this a foreshadowing. Um, sometimes I like to think of this as a, a living three-dimensional prophecy. A type in the Bible is a real event that happens, but it foreshadows, it pictures something in the future that is yet to come. So there's many, many of these in the scriptures. Now again, you, you, gotta, you gotta be careful and don't try to make types or look for types in places, there's a bug around my head, see that? Um, don't try to allegorize the scriptures. St. Augustine and a bunch of other people, there's even some really famous Bible teachers in Calvary Chapel that, te that make a tendency towards doing this. You don't want to look at everything like it's symbolic. You don't want to allegorize the scriptures. And so, but there are places where the Bible gives you the green light to do that or where the symbolism and the foreshadowing is so clear, it is so precise that virtually everybody agrees that's a type that was given to us by the Lord on purpose. For example, in Genesis chapter 22, this is where Abraham, where he sacrifices, well, almost sacrifices Isaac in his, his worship, his obedience to the Lord. Now, let me read through kind of a summary description of the story, 
And you tell me if you can, can see the type or see the, the foreshadowing, the symbolism represented in the story. The father, with instruments of judgment, he takes the son, who carries wood on his back up Mount Moriah. The father is intending to sacrifice his son as an act of worship, and the son humbly and obediently submits to the father's will. The son is compared to a sacrificial lamb by the father, but yet the son is spared and received back from the dead by the father. Now, that's a real event that happened. Abraham is a real individual. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all claim and know that he existed. So this event really took place. It really happened. But does it foreshadow something else? It sure does. Who does it foreshadow? It foreshadows God the Father and God the Son, Jesus, and that sacrifice that Jesus made upon the cross. The father with instruments of judgment, Abraham had fire in his hand and he had a knife, takes the son who carries wood on his back up Mount Moriah. Did you know that's the same mountain as Calvary? By the way, don't believe me, but Golgotha or Mount Calvary, you know what the elevation is above sea level? 777 feet. Don't believe me. You just check it out for yourself. But I've seen it on numerous maps. It's either 777 meters or 777 feet. It's interesting. And so the father is intending to sacrifice the son as an act of worship. The father did that with Christ. And the son humbly and obediently submits to the father's will. Isaac was not a young boy like as is pictured in most of these pictures. Isaac would have been in his 30s, could have easily resisted, could have easily overcome the father, but he submitted and basically said, not my will, but your will be done, just like Jesus. The son is compared to a sacrificial lamb by the father. That's what Jesus was called. John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and the son is received back from the dead. Because in the mind of Abraham, he already did it, but God gave him back. It was a resurrection, and Jesus was resurrected. Think that's coincidence? No, that's a, that's a structure, that's a type that's meant to give us a message. We also have two chapters later in Genesis 24 where the servant seeks a bride for the son. So you may not be familiar with this story, but this is where the servant of Abraham, Eliezer, this is where he goes back to their homeland and he seeks a bride for Isaac from those people. Let me read you the story again. See if you can find the foreshadowing or the type the father sends out the servant to find a bride for his son. The servant, who is unnamed, interacts with the woman who responds positively to him. There is supernatural guidance involved. The bride or the, the woman agrees to become the bride to the son. The servant gives precious gifts to the bride. It is prophesied that she will become the mother of millions of descendants and eventually, the bride and the son are married. Who is that? That's God the Holy Spirit being sent out by God the Father into the world to gather a bride for the son, Jesus. The servant is unnamed. The Holy Spirit testifies always of Jesus. The servant interacts with the woman. Jesus told us that the, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The woman responds positively to the servant and there's supernatural guidance involved. That happens when you come to Christ in your salvation experience. She agrees to become the bride and she is given gifts. That's what happens to you when you become a Christian. You get the gift of salvation, but also spiritual gifts as a Christian. And she becomes the mother of millions of descendants. The church, millions and billions of people have filled her ranks and the bride and the son will one day be married, and aren't we waiting for that, for Jesus to return? And the last type is in Genesis chapter 30 all the way through Genesis chapter 50. This is Joseph. Did you know that there is more written about Joseph in the book of Genesis than any other person? More than Abraham, more than Isaac, more than Jacob? There are 21 chapters written about this fascinating character, Joseph, and I believe the reason for that is he is one of the most powerful types, one of the most powerful pictures of Jesus. Joseph is rejected by his brothers. He is quote unquote murdered by them. But then later he is exalted and he is worshiped. 
In his first coming, he is despised, he is rejected, but in his second appearance, so to say, the same people that rejected him, they worship him and they recognize him. As a matter of fact, if you look over the 21 chapters of Joseph's life, there are over 100 similarities to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, read Joseph's story and then cross-reference it with Philippians chapter 2 where Paul describes the condescension of Jesus to this world and then his exaltation, and you'll find so many similarities. All right. Now, the next one is in Numbers chapter one. Now, Carly, don't show the, okay, don't show the picture yet because back in Puerto Rico, she fired it too early. All right. Now, this is your favorite book of the Bible, Book of Numbers, right? Raise your hand if you've ever read the Book of Numbers from beginning to end. Be honest. All right. That's good. You guys are honest. In Puerto Rico, like everybody raised their hand, and I knew it wasn't true. So the book of Numbers, right? You know, Leviticus, Numbers, these are the books of your Bible where if you have a paper Bible, those pages on the side are totally clean, you know, because you never open them. But again, how much of the scripture is inspired by God? All of it. So should you read Leviticus? Oh, yeah. Leviticus is one of the most beautiful books in the Old Testament because it is a symbolic allegorical book and wow, beautiful pictures of Jesus. But even the book of Numbers. Now, it is a little challenging to read it because it's full of, well, numbers, right? But in Numbers chapter one and two, what you discover is as you read it, and don't click the picture yet, Carly, Numbers chapter one and two, if you read it, it describes, as you can see there, the formation of the camp of Israel. And you guys know, Pastor Dan has taught you well, that the tabernacle is in the center of the camp, and the Jews camped in the wilderness to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. But what you actually discover is that they, they camped in the formation of a cross. Now, I didn't believe this when I first read this, and so I went to the chapters myself, and I put a dot on the paper for every 10,000 people, and sure enough, if they camp in north, south, east, and west, now you can do the picture, Carly, they camped in the formation of a cross out on the wilderness, which is fascinating, right? Because do you remember what happened when Balaam tried to curse the people of Israel? Remember what happened? He climbed up to a hilltop, a mountaintop, numerous times, and he tried to call down cursing on them, but what ended up coming out of his mouth? Blessing. And isn't it interesting that he would have been looking down on the cross? And so the cross is what saves you from the curse of sin. So here you have, I think, a very interesting and powerful picture. It's just the cross. But even more interesting, further still, is if you look at this picture, or if you read Numbers chapters 1 and 2, on the north and south and east and west, they had a flag, they had a kind of a symbolic flag for each, of the, for each of the three tribes that were there. So as you can see there, uh, there was an ox on the west, an eagle to the north, a lion to the east, and a man to the south. Does that sound familiar? Ox, eagle, lion, and man. That's in numbers. If you keep your finger there in your Bible and flip to Revelation chapter 4 and 5, you see the living creatures before the throne of God, which, by the way, the tabernacle is a picture, number one, of Jesus, but number two, of heaven. And so in Revelation 4 and 5, when it describes heaven, the throne room of heaven, you have the zoe, the living creatures. And John tells us that one looked like an ox, one looked like an eagle, one looked like a lion, and one looked like a man. And for centuries, Bible teachers and church historians have identified those four symbolic animals with the four Gospels. Because the ox is an animal of service, and doesn't the Gospel of Mark present Jesus as the servant of God? Man, well, as a man, and the Gospel of Luke portrays Jesus as the Son of Man, the perfect man, because it was written to the Greeks. Then you have the lion. This is the Gospel of Matthew, which portrays Jesus as the king, the king of Israel, because the lion is the king of all beasts. And then, of course, the eagle. In ancient cultures, that was a divine messenger because it can fly straight into the sun. And doesn't the Gospel of John portray Jesus as the Son of God? And so most people see a definite connection with the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of John. Think that's coincidence? I don't think so. 
So that is the structure of types. And the last one, one of my favorite, is the structure of seven. We're almost done, then we're going to take a break. So these are divine signatures upon the Bible. You know it's the strongest, most reliable human book. The manuscripts, greatest in quantity and quality. The archaeology and history, rock solid. But you even have prophecy and scientific foreknowledge and this unique structure, the structure of names, the structure of types, and here, the structure of seven. Now, this is something that's unique. This is from, this is from Chuck Missler, and I think this is good stuff. But it's also from another PhD named Dr. Ivan Panin. He was a Russian Jew who became a Christian. Now, the structure of seven, this is called heptatic structure. Heptatic structure. Dr. Ivan Panin, he was a unique individual because when he became a Christian, he for some reason dedicated his life to finding seven all through the Bible. And I'm not talking about where it says the seven lamps or the seven spirits. I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about in the Hebrew grammar and in the Greek grammar, multiples of seven or somehow the embedded structure of seven. Now, you shouldn't go chasing after something like that if you're just reading your Bible, but remember what we're talking about? We're talking about God authenticating the scriptures as from him. So let's investigate this and you'll see what I mean. In Genesis chapter one, the Hebrew construction here of this verse, you know, in English it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But in the original Hebrew language, there's seven words. Bershith Elohim, Vara et Shamaim et Eretz. Seven words in the original language. That may not seem significant to you, but to the Jewish rabbi, is seven a significant number? Yeah, to them it's the number of perfection and completion. So just because of that fact alone, that Genesis 1-1 had seven words in the original Hebrew, the rabbis believed that after Genesis 1-1, the universe was finished and complete and done. In an instant moment of creation. Interesting that that's what science has actually proven to be the case. But, but beyond just the seven actual words, as you dig deeper into the Hebrew grammar, there's multiples of seven with the Hebrew letters. Listen to this. The number of words, as I told you, is seven, but also the number of letters in that original Hebrew verse. The number of letters is 28, which is seven times four. The first three words of that verse have 14 letters, seven times two. The last four letters, seven times two. The fourth and fifth words have seven letters. The sixth and seventh words have seven letters. The key words in the verse, God, heaven, and earth, they have 14 total letters, seven times two. And the four remaining words, they have 14 letters, seven times two. Is that coincidence? Well, I don't know. You tell me. Even beyond this, even beyond the structure of seven in the first verse of the Bible, Dr. Ivan Panin and other people, they have looked for significant words in the scripture, and what they come to find out is that significant words or phrases in the Old and New Testament, many of them happen to appear in multiples of seven. For example, the word hallelujah appears 28 times in scripture, seven times four. The word hosanna appears seven times in scripture. The word shepherd appears 21 times in scripture, seven times three. The word Yehovah Sabaoth, which is the most common compound name of God, the Lord of heaven's armies, it appears 287 times, which is seven times 41. Isaac, Isaac, you should take note of this. That name appears 126 times in scripture, seven times 18. The name Aaron appears 448 times, seven times 64. And the expression Christ at the right hand of God appears 21 times, seven times three. The words after Melchizedek appear seven times in scripture. The expression, the stone which the builders rejected, seven times. And love your neighbor as yourself, you guessed it, seven times in the Bible. That is heptatic structure. And last but not least, before we take our break, we'll turn to the genealogy of Matthew chapter one. Now again, this is a chapter, Matthew chapter one, that you might make the mistake of skipping, but are you gonna do that ever again in your life? No, you forever repented of that type of behavior, right? Because remember Genesis five, remember Numbers chapter one and two, lists or genealogies, there's something that you can glean out of that. Just wait, Carly, to, to click the next thing, please. So if you read, actually go ahead, click the next one, I'm sorry, I forgot that slide. So if you read the 
genealogy of Jesus, it doesn't seem very interesting on the surface of it because you have 41 names all the way from Abraham to Jesus. Now let me tell you this, the obvious meaning and the obvious purpose of Matthew chapter one is very important. It's to establish the royal genealogy of Jesus. Remember, the golden rule of Bible interpretation is that the most obvious sense is the important sense. So Matthew is his royal genealogy and Luke is his human genealogy. So the, the biggest reason that we can, the biggest thing we can get for Matthew chapter one is that Jesus and Jesus alone is the king of Israel. He has the divine right to sit upon the throne because he is Messiah. But so this gentleman, Dr. Ivan Panin, he looked at the Greek construction of Matthew and he discovered a lot of features that have to do with heptatic structure. Let me read some of them to you. You can click on it now, Carly. The number of words in the genealogy is divisible by seven. The number of letters, divisible by seven. The number of vowels, divisible by seven. The number of nouns, the number of consonants. The number of names is divisible by seven. The number of words in that genealogy that begin with a vowel is divisible by seven. The number of words that begin with a consonant. The number of words that occur more than once divisible by seven. The number of words that occur in more than one form is divisible by seven. The number of words that occur in only one form and the number of words that are not nouns is divisible by seven. The number of other kinds of nouns, the number of male names, and the number of generations, those are all divisible by seven. And that is what you call, as I said, authentication technology. Whether you're looking at prophecy or scientific foreknowledge or these unique aspects of the Greek structure of the grammar or Hebrew, there is no way that could happen randomly. And so can you trust your Bible? Absolutely. You can trust it as a human book because it is without parallel in human ancient literature because of the manuscripts, archaeology, and history. But you can also know that the Bible is inspired of God for many reasons, but also because of prophecy, scientific foreknowledge, and God has signed it with a signature in this unique structure. When I read stuff like this, I just kiss my Bible. I go, thank you, Lord, for the word of God. I love this book because it really is from God. So you can learn it, you can love it, and you should live it. Let's take a 10-minute break, and now that we have covered the evidence for the existence of God, and we know that the Bible is the word of God, now we're gonna finish up by focusing on Jesus, and it's gonna be great. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We pray that you just refresh us now with a quick break, and give us grace, Jesus, as we look at you uh, in the rest of our time today. In your name we pray, amen.